Nice intro for the morning. Fresh off a of cold. Stay cold. <laughs> Cheese. What up, Doc? You know, this is gonna be the last one for like the next two years. Nah, I get it. Huh. Caffeine morning show. Sticks. We're gonna do this thing like this. What's up, what's up? AM Caffeine Show. What up? It's your boy DOC. It's your girl Marlo J. DJ Smooth Melo D. Yes, sir. And we are back. Marlo J, what's popping? Everything, me. <laughs> you know, I'll pop it. She's so. What? Smo D, what's up, homie? Because <laughs> I can't. You good, Smooth? Just try. <laughs> Smooth, are you on mute? Say hey, something. Are you frozen? What is. What are you doing? We can't hear you. I don't, I don't know what, what's oh, going on, Smooth? What about now? Go. What about now? Are you okay? Oh, okay. That's so okay. embarrassing. We have a special guest. <laughs> this, this this production sucks. I can't work under these conditions. I can't work under it's these conditions. Looking like. <laughs> and oh, we have yeah. a show. Let me give a special shout out to our girl Mila from 702, who was our guest last yeah, week. Yeah, yeah. You guys can yeah, check yeah. that interview out right now. It's on YouTube, available. Super dope. She has a brand new project just that just came out on uh, her new video was actually uh, debuted the day that the interview was debuted. So you can check out Mila's brand new uh, video and single available right now. But today we have a special guest, man. He's not even, I'm not even gonna say he's a guest, he's a friend. Uh, he's been on the AM Caffeine show once before. But what's crazy is I didn't realize my history with this guy until okay. he sent me this picture Last week, about 12 a.m., he Let sent me, me a text of a picture where I was at his birthday party in 1995. Uh -huh. I was like, yo, where the hell did you get this picture from? So let me tell you about my man, Paul Stewart. If you don't already know, now you will. Um, extremely important figure in the landscape of music. He has uh, introduced so many of our favorite uh, musical artists from Montel Jordan, to Coolio, The Far Side, Warren G, and the, just the list goes on with all his accomplishments. Um, he's, working say, on, he's working on some TV uh, stuff. He has a, a trailer out, you guys should check it out. If you don't know about him, you're gonna get familiar, go to YouTube right now, there's a trailer called A White Boy from Crenshaw. And the trailer will explain a little bit. It'll give you a brief synopsis of how he got started and all the things that he's accomplished uh, in this music industry. Super special guest, my homeboy, the one and only Paul Stewart in the building today. Oh, man. When is he going to say your name in these streets? I mean, you know, before I say his name, I need to make sure I gave him all the accolades as much as I could. I know, right. but you talked about wanted to talk to him about <laughs> you got folks got to know what it is you got to understand the origin but the, he his, his journey and his story is so extensive marla i could never you know uh summarize it in, in so quick so you'll be able to ask all the questions that you want. Yo, and hold on real quick man since we on ig live right now i gotta shout out folks checking in the homie kareem grimes is checking in big mo uh, is checking oh, in man, uh, Justice is checking in. Miss Lele Eleven is checking in on us right now. So dope! So shout out to everybody that's watching us right now on Instagram Live. We're on Twitch. Uh, we're on Zoom. We're on MySpace. We're on Farmers Only. Me, Farmers we're, right, Only. we're everywhere. No, we're not on. I'm, I'm we're not, not on. okay. <laughs> so the one and only Paul Stewart. P, what's up, homeboy? What's going oh, on, P? Oh man, thank you for that wonderful intro, man. You know, I'll pay you later. Yeah, please do. I, hey, it's, we're, it's COVID, Paul. I'm taking everything, man. I'm taking post-data checks. What, what, yeah, yeah. Any form of payment, I'm taking. <laughs> so, man, Paul, no. yes. you have this trailer out, A White Boy from Crenshaw, and it, like I said, it kind of summarizes a little bit about your journey. What, what made you decide to do that now? Well, you know, it's funny. I was, um, I was sitting at uh, Haran Coffee. Shout out to uh, Chase. Uh, coffee shop in Lamert. Shout uh, out Chase. Yes. Shout out Chase Infinite and uh, Tony, uh, Tony Magnetic, also up in there. You know, running the kitchen and everything, and uh, helping Chase with that. Those guys. So I, you know, I was sitting at, outside their cafe having a coffee, 
I've been spending a lot of time in Lemur, and I live in Crenshaw now, and I came up with the idea of the name of a white boy from Crenshaw, and I just knew that that would get attention because those two don't really go together. You know what right. I mean? Right. And it's kind of that brainstorm. And then I was trying to find somebody to help me cut the trailer, and this this guy had sent me a, a biopic of the Far Side, uh, Marcus Thorington, a younger cat, and and we're in the process of getting that made and produced. Oh. And I said, "Oh man, you know what? You want to help me with this? You're an editor, right?" And he was like, "Yeah." And then, and he made the uh, he calls it a mini doc, right? So he made the little trailer, and and I just put it out with the hopes of finding the right partners to make the movie. And uh, it worked like gangbusters, you know? I mean, people are coming out the woodwork and uh, I'm getting offers from big companies and it's amazing, you know? But um, I kind of used a philosophy that I learned way back when I first started, right? One of my first jobs was working for Ice Cube. Uh, he had a record label called Street Knowledge and his manager who, you know, was like my boss, you know, him, Cube and her, Pat Charbonnet, super intelligent black woman, you know, was kind of took me under her wing, was schooling me a little bit, you know. And at that time, they were just making Fridays. And, I, and she was telling me about how they did it. And the story she told me always stuck with me. She said, uh, we have the script and, you know, new, we're trying to get money from New Line and Priority. Nobody want to give us money. So we made a press release and we opened a production office. Like, we're making it, even though they didn't have the money. Right. And then everyone started trying to throw the money at them to do it. So you just That's kind of what I did. It, I made the trailer. Right. I made the trailer. <laughs> that one out. And, uh, and kind of, uh, you know, it came. So, you know what I mean? Like, I was like, I'm doing it. And the response been phenomenal. I mean, Snoop is fucking with it. Issa Rae. I got big ups from like Cypress Hill, House of Pain, Fab Freddy, uh, DJ Pooh, and all kind of TV producers and film producers. And yeah, so it's been real exciting, you know? So you do your own, you know, and it's interesting too, as we were talking about earlier about how COVID kind of inspired some work things because I wasn't working on any other project. So this was kind of like a passion thing I wanted to do about myself for a while. And I was able to take the time and do it because I wasn't working. Right, right. Marlo J. I, I Marlo J. Say, <laughs> I was going to say, um, do you remember when you realize that, and you kind of hint on it in the trailer, but do you realize the moment that you realize being the skin I'm in from where I'm from is different? I forgot everything when I saw that smile right there. But no, um, yes, actually, there it goes. Um, <laughs> you know, I got a funny story about that, right? I was in fourth grade and I was going to Baldwin Hills Elementary and I was uh, literally like, maybe there were two white kids at the whole school. And, you know, some Japanese people, maybe like three or four percent Japanese, you know what I mean? And the rest were black. And um, I didn't really I was pretty sheltered to racism because I hadn't been experiencing any really. And um, I was running for some student office. And my mom pulled me aside. And she said, you, you know, I don't want you to get upset if, if you don't win. Some people might not vote for you because you're white. And that kind of fucked my head up and I was like really you know I hadn't thought of that and then I won so I was like ah she don't know shit <laughs> <laughs> no, just like, no mom I'm sorry I'm kidding though. but um yeah you know so that was you know there were a few things like that you know but um not not too many I mean you know because oh, oh well when I started to go to school on the west side then I realized because all the white people lived together and there were some Mexicans there or whatever so then I, I also started to realize that it was different and unique, you know, me living in this neighborhood like that, you know. And growing up in that area, like in the 80s, I mean, people weren't like, people didn't point out that you were, you were white, like they didn't call you white boy, or they, like your nickname wasn't white boy or something. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Casper. You, <laughs> you know, you get a few of those, but, but, you know, I had a, a lot of people just fucked with me, you know what I mean? I didn't really get a lot of, uh, 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 you know, it's interesting because when I was really young, like I said, I was all surrounded in this kind of environment. Then I went to some schools on the other side. So, you know, you're not as involved in the community when you're not going to school in there. But then in high school, I started hanging out with cats that lived like kind of close to like uh, Buddha Market on Slauson by Nipsey's store, you know, like over there. 
And these cats were like clowning me because I was on some white boy shit and they were just like clowning the way I dressed, clowning the way I wore my hair, clowning the upkeep of my car, clowning my whack Mac game, trying to holler at girls, just <laughs> clowning me, you know? So they started schooling me on like, you know, uh, how it was going down in black culture, how they were doing shit, you know what I mean? And so like people were wearing polos and Lacoste was the thing to be preppy then. And so I kind of merged into that vibe more, cut my hair a little different, you know, just got a little hipper, you know, from, from so the, it rubbed off on me a lot of different ways. Yeah, and those dudes used to clown me, but it was a loving clown. We were friends and there was a culture exchange too. They were like, you know, there was, well, there was always the white boy weed, you know, I always had the white boy weed. So there was always that. My weed was better. The white boy weed better? Was the white boy weed better? I heard Dallas Dallas Penn. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, white boy weed the other day, but don't, yeah, don't you, come on, man. The white boys had better weed back then. That, that was just like a known fact. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, so yeah. Like, I would yo, we with, won. Sorry, we, would, we right. won the weed. So I, would, I would come with certain like attributes like that. You know what I mean? Which they, you know. <laughs> It was a cultural exchange to some extent, but I was I was soaking up a lot more than them, you know. Right. But I accepted. I got a lot of love. Like, and that's kind of the part of the trailer was that I got this love in the community, living there. And then when I moved on to working in the entertainment industry, um, I tried I tried to give back in some ways, and it wasn't even really co consciously doing. It was just kind of like me. That's just who you were. A, a product of my environment. Yeah. Right. Right. Um. So when you make that trans when you make that transition and and you start DJing and you realize like I want to be in this music industry, right? Did you have an idea of how you wanted to be in the industry? Did you think that okay, I have a knack to find talent? Like what was or did you even have an idea or you just figured it out as you went on? No idea. There weren't a lot of examples back then too, you know what I mean? There wasn't like, you know. This was way before guys like Puffy came out or anything. You know what I mean? So, I, and I didn't know much about the industry. You know what I mean? So, I hadn't grown up around it or anything like that. So, it was just the love of the thing. I just was grinding and started DJing and doing parties and promoting and, you know, and I started writing about hip hop and worked at record stores, being a buyer of 12 inches and doing all this kind of stuff, not even really realizing that I'm kind of like learning about the industry, booking shows at college and stuff, groups and stuff, you know, and then, uh, just grinding my way up. And, and, and when I started DJing and, and, and I met a guy after I, I moved out of college and I was like, how do you get a job at the industry? He worked at Arista. He was like, oh, we might need an intern. And so that's how uh, I got my first break. But I didn't really know much about it. I was pretty ignorant to it. And um, but when I got that internship, then I just started soaking it up. And I was already doing my thing in the like streets, we'll say, like in the hip hop clubs. I, I was already involved with clubs like Water the Bush and some legendary hip hop. United Nations. Some, yeah, that was after, right. But some legendary hip hop shit in LA streets at that time, club wise. So I was starting to like, I'd already been DJing at Peace Posse. So I'd already been like doing some of the hot clubs in town as a DJ. And then I got my first industry job. And I started learning the business. Who was that person, P, who told you to uh, like, hey, come intern here? Who was that? Dean Porter at Arista Records. Nice. And yeah. wow. So you, you intern at Arista for how long? You know what's crazy? All my jobs were like one year. Uh -huh. <laughs> I've had a zillion jobs. They're all like a year. <laughs> but um, uh, yes, after that, I went to Delicious Vinyl. I got my job at Delicious Vinyl. But yeah, no. Um, but it was crazy. Yeah. I thought about the other day because the Arista internship, literally, it was like 50 hour weeks, like maybe more. And it was $100 a week they paid us. Wow. So what's crazy is you made $100 more than I did as an intern. <laughs> <laughs> It might have been a hundred a month, but what I think it was a hundred a week. Fifty right? cents an hour? I, no, well, as an intern, <laughs> no, an intern what? is you're not supposed to get paid because you're supposed to be doing it for college credit. It, it was kind of some what? under the book way they paid us, or some weird kind of way they paid us this little hundred dollars or whatever we got because we weren't employees. Obviously, we didn't have insurance; they didn't take anything well, out of our checks. And weren't in school either. They paid well, y'all we, we for in school cash. either. <laughs> but we worked we worked our full t like a regular nine to five plus the hours went longer though and then you worked at like seven eight o'clock and that's why i was saying it was like 50 60 hour weeks and then i was djing clubs at night i was out here doing party and promoting all that stuff i was getting busy at night <laughs> well i mean that's so funny i did the same exact thing interning at motown and then doing promoting clubs 
at night. So I did a, a club with Shane Mooney for like three years at the Great old Carlos and Charlie's, but I was working. We did superstars together. Me, Shane, and Adam right. Twelve was our first DJ. Right. I was interning at Motown at the time. How was so your grades? You know, that's just that you know, grinding. What'd you say, Marlo? I wasn't in school. Said, you, yeah, they were on academic probation the entire time. Oh, I was on my, academic my probation, but I really was in college. I stayed on academic probation. That's what. That's just what I did. That's where I lived. Yeah. That's where I, <laughs> I was wow. a Kareem, right. So, Pete, when, you get, delicious, when you get to delicious I was a poor student. Yeah. did Sorry. you then have an idea like, hey, I want to be an executive at, at, at some point? I mean, just the, I, when I got my job at Delicious Vinyl, I was living at my parents' house in, in, in Crenshaw District because I moved back in after college, and that was very uncomfortable. Right. Man. And, um, <laughs> Were they strict? Did, you, did they have a lot of rules? Oh, my dad didn't play. Uh, I mean, in certain things, he didn't give a fuck about, but other shit he was, he was very hard lining about. You know? But it was, just, it was just uncomfortable more than that they was, like, overly strict, per se. You know right. right. But uh, coming from from you know dishing it out and you know busting down all these broads on your own and then you come back to the house and it's like how am I supposed to pretty much <laughs> exactly. how am I right. to all that right ass in the house right 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 so it was just not you know what I, desirable for me at the moment to be and so when I got that first job at Delicious Vinyl I was able to get my first apartment and the funniest shit about my first apartment was. It was the hoodest shit on Sunset in Normandy. Okay? Oh my God. Yo, wait. Whoa. wait. There's nothing fly about Normandy. Normandy <laughs> has, it has always been a mess. Wait, hold on. Hold on. Let me tell you how ghetto this shit was, but how famous it was, right? This little building had like four floors and there were like four or five apartments on each floor, right? And it, it was a joke that only like rappers and heavy metal dudes lived in the building because in one, room was DJ Muggs and DJ Aladdin in one apartment. And this is where Muggs form in Cypress Hill. They're wow. not even out there. In fact, they had no furniture in their living room. They had their both turntables set up on either side of the room to like battle each other, right? Okay, so okay. DJ Aladdin, world-class DJ, uh, DJ Muggs in this room. The next over is Special K, old school rapper from the Treacherous uh, Three, Kumo D's group. Yeah. That's my roommate. Okay. Worst roommate I ever had. I, I gotta say it. Okay. And then and then next to him was the worst roommate. I'm gonna get to that. Give me one second. Okay. Next to that was Prince Whipper Whip and Kaz. Yeah. So it's all these old question. school rappers from New York. And and then later Faye Duvernay moved in. I moved in with him because I, I couldn't live with uh Special K. Special K was just like he had all the bills in somebody else's name, some fraudulent <laughs> shit that got turned off at like 12 at night, you know, we ain't got no electricity. Plus, he'd bring his homeboys in and, like, start break dancing in the living room at, like, 2 in the morning or some shit or whatever. But, you know. <laughs> I ain't trying to blast him. In fact, I, I got to track him down. I wonder, he probably got some stories. because I, was, I mean, that was my first apartment ever. You know, I, I mean, I, I lived on my own for a long time at college already. You know. But, uh, so, I, you know, I was just trying to survive in hip-hop. I didn't have ideas of necessarily being an executive. or It was just I had a job and, I, you know, I could move out. I still wasn't really quite maybe thinking on that level yet, you know? Right. Um, um, go ahead, Marlo. Okay, thanks. What, is there a deal that you look back of all these people that you've worked with and that you brought into the industry, is, the, is there a deal or some kind of um, contract or something that you could, if you could go back and, mm. and fix it or do it differently, was mm. there a deal or a contract or somebody you worked with that you would change? Then? Yeah, a gang of them. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> one of, I had a, pub, a co-publishing venture when I had PMP Records. And when we signed Montel, uh, we made him a co-publishing offer. But he wanted a little bit more money. And they didn't want to come up with the extra money in retrospect that would have been a, a great business investment. You know what I mean? Mm. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, there was a lot, I wasn't really a savvy business shark, you know what I mean? Which mm. is kind of part of my story. So I fucked up all kinds of deals. I and mean, we could be here all night <laughs> talking about the mistakes I made on deals and everything. But what's really interesting now is it's kind of playing in my favor. Right, right. And are, were they so much mistakes? 
Right. Because now all these other people are culture vultures. And like some of them are richer than me, but and then now I'm getting this like because of my the, the white boy from Crenshaw thing and everything, part of the whole like uh I think part of what people are so endeared about my story is I helped the artists make money and I wasn't the one like, I ain't got publishing on none of that stuff or anything, you know, and, and, and people misunderstand the publishing thing. It was a publishing deal, you know what I mean? Or whatever. But, 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 you know, just, just to, part of my whole, I think thing that's going really helping me now is that people say, Oh, he was a good guy. He helped out artists. He wasn't this culture vulture type of guy. He was a contributor to the culture. And so it's kind of in a weird way, some of my faults, or potential faults are kind of like helping me now. Right, right. In this right. new era of political correctness and people uh, uh, looking at things differently and all that, you know what I mean? Absolutely, no, ab absolutely. Right. Um, so would you say that when it's all said and done, that you would want your legacy or folks to remember you as a guy who was just, just authentic you, you didn't try to take from the culture. You always try, you know, you always try to give back. Like you say, we hear about all these culture vultures and things of that nature that you never, you know, were in a position where you try to take from the black man. You know what I'm saying? Like when you hear about white executives, that's, those are some of the stories that we tend to hear, right? Sure. Would you say that's one of the most important things that you want folks to remember you by? I'm gonna let you say it. You say it, not me. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, but. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things I'm most proud of, to be honest, and I know you can attest to this, Doc, is all the tree of the people that came out from under my thing that spread around in different places, you know? Right, right. You know, first, of all, first of all, we're going to reword that because I don't want you seeing the tree from all the things spread from under your thing. Um, <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> let's reword that. Uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of... There's a lot of uh, executives of color in this town that came out from the school. Your loins. From your, yeah, from, from your tutelage. <laughs> <laughs> Not from my loin, no. Uh, but, from your um, tutelage. Okay, got right, it. Right. Uh, so that's what I'm kind of most proud of in part is, you know what I mean? Like, I helped a lot of people have careers. You right. Know? Uh, I gave a lot of people chances early on, um, and, and people took the bar and ran with it, you know? I didn't discriminate against people if they had previous experience in the industry. Some people came from very street backgrounds. Some people didn't. People were all races at PMP. You know, we had a real rainbow coalition. It was pretty much people of color, majority black people, but we had, you know, Asians. We had some people of Arab descent. We had a few white people in there. We had definitely had Latinos, you know. Um, but yeah, I'm proud of giving that opportunity to those people and, and, and still trying to give back, you know working with artists in, uh, 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 in Crenshaw right now, a bunch of young artists in uh, uh, the area and, uh, and in the Dominican Republic with people in the most impoverished areas uh, in the whole island. Right. Marlo. I was gonna say, so when you say, earlier you said it's now just starting to work in your favor. Mm. Do, you mean, do you mean that, how, how do you mean that? Well, I mean, it's just an interesting time, right? Because first of all, there's a lot of nostalgia for the era where I was very active, right? The golden era, the 80s, the 90s hip hop thing. And so because I was involved in that in a lot of interesting ways, uh, that's kind of making my story interesting to people, for one thing, right? Uh, but the fact that I wasn't uh, vulture-ish of the culture and that I gave back to it, uh, uh, before, like a lot of people might say, oh, he wasn't cutthroat enough business person. He should have made more money and this kind of thing stuff. Is the kind of thing that you might hear from a lot of people of all colors. You know what I mean? Whereas now there's more of an attitude of like artists are get, I mean, getting jerked. People understand artists are getting jerked in the industry. And so like the people who made a lot of money from it, the start, some of them are getting villainized. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Some rightfully so, for sure. You know what I mean? So I think people just have a different perspective on it now, too, because everything's transparent now. You know, people putting their record deals up online and, you know, and all these kind of, you know, yeah, right. Kanye's complaining, but he ain't letting little Sean up. Uh, he let Big Sean out. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, you know, so it's a lot of Sean being let out a long time ago. We don't even know where he at. Right. <laughs> Big Sean oh. can't get out. <laughs> right. I'm sorry. No, but, um, 
my man's running up that good over here. So, you know. Chris, um, and, I see, and I see Chris, he keep peeking in every once in a while. I'm, yeah, we're gonna we're, stay we're gonna highlight his activities before we get done. Yeah, but um, yeah. So I mean, I think it's just it's it's a good time to have been a, a good person in the industry, and then I had all these unique experiences and stuff. And also, too, it's like, um, see, I'm a creative business person, and when the industry first started, it was very, we were very more valued because the the big companies didn't even understand hip hop. And after a while, they're like, oh, we got our own corny announce person. We don't need you, you know. So it was like people like me got devalued, you know. It, also, too, like when they started doing stuff off statistics, they just started going the money ball thing. Well, okay, like this is charting in uh, North Carolina, so we're gonna sign that. It, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that whole era, when that whole came into play, then sometimes people like me. Luckily, I had segue more to music supervision, but you know, my kind of a and r -ing and, and, and and management thing for the most part kind of ended after my big runs that I had, you know? Mm -hmm. So Pete, some of your your bigger signings that are the, the bigger artists that you found, were they actually signed when you got PMP and your PMP deal, uh, you were distributed through Def Jam? When you, when you had, when you had the big office, PMP the started as a street promotion company. Then it morphed into a music management company. Okay. So at first I was managing Farside. Briefly, I was House of Pain's manager. Where, you know, I shopped in the record deal. I was I was Coolio's manager, all as PMP management. Right. Then I got the deal with uh, Def Jam, and it became a label. Right. And, and then after my Def Jam label. distribution, I got a deal with Loud. And so everybody that you were managing, you took up under your label? No, I wasn't able to do that. They were already signed. They were already signed. But I had, I had a deal where like, it, I could still always usually manage artists outside of those, outside of the Def Jam deal and the Loud deal. I was still able to like manage artists that weren't through my deal. What, I just was, had the biggest check, what was the biggest check that you received from a major label for PMP or for distribution from on the record side, like what was that? What was the biggest check? Well, probably when we did the deal with Loud, when we did the Loud deal, and that was after Def Jam. Yeah, yeah, that's when we had the big office on Beverly on the rooftop. Okay, see, I, I, had, I had like twenty people working for me. I was, you hey, know, I was spending you, the money. You I wasn't like, Paul. You yeah. was doing too much. Right. You balled out of control. He right. balled out of control. I lost out. Well, that's part of my story. He got a penthouse student, penthouse office. Oh, I had the penthouse <laughs> office. office. It was on the top of the roof. I was, he had parties. I was there. Right. And at the same time, I was, you know, I, I was putting 10,000 in my sound system. I was throwing, you know, $10,000 birthday parties that, that, you know, I was a $10,000 bed. I was, I was, you know, I was, I had the house with the streaming running through it, you know, in, in, in Studio City at the pool. I was doing too much. So it's like, but that's the thing. Like I was yeah. always half artist house. as much with as I was. Business. Right, right. Exactly. Exactly. With a stream, you had natural, a natural river flow through your house. That shit was fly. <laughs> you got pictures. I need to see that. Yeah, it was on. It was on uh, um, where the house was. Was off Laurel Canyon, in between Ventura and and uh, uh, Mohon. So there's a stream that runs uh, down Laurel, and I'm like the first house right on the corner. So that, that was that was the stream. Was that uh, that Wait, was an outpost but, though, right? That was an outpost. No, that was uh, that outpost was before outpost was a house that I lived in Hollywood Hills that George Duke was the owner of. And he lived next door to us on Outpost Circle. And that's where I threw the legendary parties with like helicopters and like drew down cussing out police. And, uh, you know, they what? was like on some like Dr. Dre pool party legendary stats. But that was on the Outpost. That was in Hollywood Hills. And, but I rented that house. That's where we recorded Gangster's Paradise and a bunch of shit. But when I got to deal with Loud, I bought the house in Studio City. Got you. And this is part of my whole story, too. I started flossing out of control. I moved out of L.A. I'm in Studio City. I hated the idea of being on the other side of Mulholland. And I was barely on the other side, but I still hated it. I, I consider myself an OG <laughs> so L.A. First, motherfucker. You know? First so was house that, on, the, on the north side of Mulholland. <laughs> so was that over by uh, Carl Canizzo house? Uh, for yeah, Cedric the Entertainer's old house yeah. right near Carl Kanai. Like, okay, when you coming down Laurel, Carl Kanai's was on the left side, yep. on that little hill. Mine yep. was a few more uh, 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 things down to the right. Okay, 
you're going to remember it if you remember that right. So you're going down the hill, the first light, Canton, it's right there. Yeah. And Seb used to live right around the corner, too. South, South Which St. Louis, said, said entertainer. Cedric Sabalas, Cedric Entertainer. Cedric Entertainer. Okay, because yeah. Cedric Sabalas was big back in the day too. Yeah, he was though. Cedric said was big. He had his own label. What HYB it was like? Handle your oh, business. Oh right, handle like, your like business. Your I remember situation. that. Wow, peace. Yeah, so I've lost out. I've lost out. I, lost I started out. acting oh, like an artist. You ab you absolutely did. Um, so when you did that, when you did that deal, what artist did you have with you that you brought with you to that deal, or was it like based off of what they felt you could do in the future? Yeah, it, what, what had happened was I had done the Def Jam deal already. You know, Montel had come out. I was having some legal issues with Def Jam. Nobody was really would fuck with me. And, why, and, and what Def, was that about? Like, what was the issue, if you could tell us? Yeah, I, mean, I could tell you. I mean, I, I got to leave some shit for the book, man. And, and the white boy on Crenshaw. White well, boy sure. that, that's movie, why I said no, whatever, whatever you no, can tell um, that's not going to, that you can. Yeah, you know, no, I mean, but you can tease it. Okay, I'm going to tease it. I had the deal with Def Jam, and then one day they sent me a letter that said, you're fired, we're suing you, and they sent another letter to every label and publishing company, major label in the industry, and said, if you hire Paul Stewart or give him a deal, we'll sue you because he's under contract to us. But how could you be under contract if they fired you? Good point. Wow. Hey, but, cliffhanger. You know, this is crazy. Wow. So, so anywho, uh, the loud deal. So no one would really fuck with me, and then Gangsters Paradise came out, and that shit. Then everybody so was like, "Hey, Paulie, you just kidding?" Motherfuckers like, started taking running jumps to jump on my. <laughs> <laughs> So when, so when that happens, Paul, you just go back to management, just the artists that you had, and you were just strictly- Everybody moved into the house on Outpost. PMP was working out of my house. Right. I was managing, yeah. yeah. That's where we recorded Gangsta's Paradise, right there. Wow. So, okay. And the label was like, oh, we're cool on it. I said, well, I'm gonna try to get in a movie then. They said, okay. All right, y'all, so once again, man. In, in and Dangerous, Dangerous Minds. And the rest is history. Crazy because let me tell you that that song, I think that that song made LV a, um, a, a household name. Right. Okay. Like, we got a, a question from IG asking, Paul, did you manage LV as well? I managed LV, Coolio, and the producer who made the song. Ooh. Oh, so you got all the coins. And that producer, not what, really, was but that, was that Wino? No. That was Doug Rashid. Doug Rashid, okay. No, Wino did most all the Coolio stuff. That's my homie, Scromy, Wino. Right. Wino gets big props. Wino, Wino put me onto a lot of stuff because he was like the first real street dude that I worked with like in a professional capacity, you know, more oh, or less. But, and but, his name um, was Wino. Wino wasn't playing, yeah, Wino was still ain't playing. Is that indicative of his personality? <laughs> <laughs> well, his drinking right. habits. <laughs> What, well, you know, know, was he related to Ned the Wino? <laughs> <laughs> Wino was from Carson, East Coast, whatever, whatever. You know, uh, I think that was like a street name or something. And yeah, yeah. I think okay. it came from his. Uh, I don't want to play the Wino because you know, pew pew pew, Mr. Twenty Two. Yeah. And Wino <laughs> still doing a lot of work. He's, he's in Vegas now, still working with Coolio. Matter of fact, and I, I just seen him last night. I just, just went out there, him, right? Because I think you were with Ken Francis, right? Didn't Ken I rolled up on him yesterday? Uh, went out, yeah. out to Vegas, hung out. I hadn't seen Coolio for years. Hung out with those dudes, Wino, Coolio. It was a reunion. Yeah, it was great. But yeah, but what was crazy is so I managed LV. Doug was my roommate, the producer, and check out how I met him. I was working for Singleton on the Sony lot, and he was a security guard parking cars, and he's like, listen to my beats. Wow. Security wow. guard, parking cars. Wow. He wasn't parking the car, but he was like directing where to park. Hey, he so on, on that tape that he gave you, Gangster's Paradise. Was, was, was it a tape? It was, it was a cassette. cassette. It was a cassette, for sure, that was a tape. What was it? Was it Maxwell or TDK? <laughs> I can tell you this much. I was on a, a brick phone courtesy of Big Boy. Wow. Big Boy, Power One and Big Boy, that we bought from him for $100 a month, chipped up. That motherfucker would last. <laughs> That's crazy. Hey, we got a, a question from Kareem asking, what was that Gangsta's Paradise type? What was that Gangsta's Paradise check looking like? 
and Barry Gordy got the big chunk. I was gonna say what what was what was the but you know I, the first of all one thing that's crazy is not only did Dangerous Minds want to use it the advance, but uh, Bad Boys wanted to use it. We were almost the song almost came in Bad Boys, and what was crazy was I only know knew two music supervisors at the time, and they both wanted to use the song. And they offered us, and they were both Simpson Bruckheimer movies. Oh, wow. So they wouldn't really compete against each other, but they offered us 100 racks for the song. I still never got 100 Jeez. racks again for a song, for, for a movie placement, you know? But it went in there, and... Uh, and then so is that crazy. why you went with Dangerous Minds? Because the because the check was bigger than for Bad Boys? No, they wouldn't compete against each other. They matched each other. Oh, got you, got you. And we were, I was leaning towards Bad Boy. I mean, I knew Will. I had a personal relationship with Will and Martin. I right. DJed on both of their TV shows. Right. But the woman at MCA who wanted the song for Dangerous Minds, she I could just tell that I was going to be able to like uh, flip that to more business. I ended right. up getting Coolio's group Gat, worst oh, singing group God. ever, Gangsters and yeah. Thugs, signed to MCA <laughs> off of that. Right, right. Talk about licks. <laughs> I should get the award for that. I should get the award for that, what that I was, was able that? to get a deal. Dude, I remember Gat. I remember Gat. They do not. They were on MCA. They had the most offensive song. Oh, Booty Lick. What's it called? Booty Lick or something? I want a booty lick right now or something. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) They were were clips who could barely sing. They were harmonizing. And and I don't want to diss them because my man Big Blue and some of the dudes did have some talent. There was something there. Blue who? Big Blue. There was a dude called Big Blue. Not mm-hmm. Big Blue that ended up getting a deal at Motown Blue. Big okay. Blue? You my boy, Blue. I know. Well, if that's the Maybe. Blue thinking about, that's crazy. Because Blue can sing, if it's who I'm thinking about. Blue can trail? If you don't sing. Oh, your man. <laughs> Paul Stewart, you should get a Lifetime Achievement Award for getting Gat a deal. <laughs> <laughs> Not Lifetime Achievement. <laughs> But if you're in the comments now, go look up uh, Gangsters and Thugs. Nobody could have did that. No. Booty <laughs> They're hard to find, I think, on the interwebs, Stephen. But, um, um, but, you know, that woman, really, she put, like, the song MTV wouldn't play the video at first, you know? And she was like, I'm going to put Michelle Pfeiffer in the video and all this stuff. And, you know, Antoine Fuqua directed that video and um, the Gangsters Paradise and all that. And uh, they wouldn't play it. So she spent a zillion dollars on ads on MTV. And it was like a one minute ad that was just a one minute of the commercial uh-huh. of the video of Gangster's Paradise, basically. And after she started running them ads, they started getting all these requests for it. And they kind of had to add it. Right, right. And then it just took off. People just loved it. Talk about Stevie bullying Wonder. your way into the industry. TV Wonder, man. You know? <laughs> I was going to say, so how was that? Did you have a conversation? Oh, back to Kareem's question, yeah. They got 75% of the publishing. So the publishing got split three ways. But I'm not trying to put everybody's business out there, I guess, but Coolio, LV, and Doug Rashida split the 25% three ways. And you, and what did you get? I didn't really make that much because, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't end up managing everybody that long because it takes a long time to get the checks and stuff. You, you ain't never lie. Right. right. Yeah. So by the so time I, they I got managed the Coolio for five years, but, but that was getting near the end or closer to the, you know, like, Coolio fired me a month after he won a Grammy for, uh, <laughs> Love you, Coolio. No. Uh, um, Bye. He, well, he told me the other day that it was the worst decision made in his career. So, hey, hey big Well, pop. yeah, that yeah. and but, still holding on to those last three braids. Oh, wow. Well, hey, we another question. Wow. Another Everybody's question. got to evolve. Everybody's got to evolve. Please evolve. I'm going to drink I'm, my tea I'm, right I'm, now. I'm going to drink my tea. Another question from oh, IG. And, uh, oh, right quick. Shouts out T Nesbitt. Shouts out Jamie Justice, Kareem Grimes, Unlimited Legacy. K Panda that just checked in. You have a question that says, "Did you receive a Grammy as well for, for no. Paradise?" No. Were you supposed to? <laughs> I mean, no, no. Managers don't get Grammys. No, you know. Really? Black at no. least. The songwriters of the song get the Grammy. Yeah, everybody does, and sometimes even the songwriters they don't actually get the trophy. They get uh, what you would consider a like, like a, a thing. <laughs> some or like a plaque or something. Like a plaque, yeah. but they don't get the trophy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, okay. what? So the performers don't get the trophy? The performer will get the trophy, and like I and think it's only the writers get a trophy. So right. what about the producers? Well, if the producers usually are writers on it, so 
I think they then they usually do. Shit, it depends. Hmm. But it depends, yeah, on the kind of thing. I and I'm I don't quote me on that because I'm not 100 percent sure, but managers know. Damn, that sucks. And, and I had like, a lot, and I did have so much to do with it because I managed everybody. Else. But no, I mean, hey, look, you know, it's just amazing that I was able to be a part of that. You know what I mean? And like, I mean, that's very humble of you to say. That right. is, I, that would not be my attitude at all. <laughs> Where the hell is my Grammy at? I want all the like, world. All you motherfuckers to the mountaintop. <laughs> you mean tell me nobody gonna get me no Grammy? No, but in retrospect, <laughs> they keep all the Grammys. Let me get the paperwork straight and get my checks going. But no, but like I said before, you know. Um, I don't have any regrets either, you know. Right. I have a blessed life. I helped a lot of people have blessed lives, and you know. P, how was that? How was that conversation with Stevie? Like the first time you had a you had a conversation with Stevie Wonder regarding the song. Well, the first time it was I met him when we performed uh, at the MTV Awards with him. Right. In the song. It was already big. So it wasn't like I didn't call Stevie and be like, hey, can we use, I didn't call Stevie and be like, hey, can we use your song or no shit? No, I understand that. Yeah, we know that. But I mean, once he got wind of it. And you might have Stevie on speed dial because I know I actually, hey, you work for her. That's your boss, right? I don't want to. No, no need to toot horns or none of that. But yeah, I got Stevie. I can call Stevie at any time. Now, that will he pick up? Is a whole different thing. <laughs> right. So That's different. That's different. Right. Um, no, I mean, that was a highlight of my life. I mean, Stevie Wonder is one of my all-time favorite artists. I mean, I remember Eddie Murphy making that skit about people, like, insulting Stevie Wonder. Like, that's how I feel. Like, right. you know, like, I mean, Stevie's, like, the best ever. So just to be able to, like, work with him and everything, he's just humble and great and, you know, you know, like Quincy Jones, humble and, you know, being around, having any time around... I thought very. I mean, spending any time around guys like that just made me be like, you know, you can be as successful as anybody and still remain humble. That that's something I really admired about him. But yeah, I mean, that was amazing. I mean, Stevie was just all love, you know. I mean, shit, he was probably making a boatload off that shit. So yeah. right, right, right. <laughs> like, yeah, like, kids, keep doing much. that shit. Right, <laughs> right. Go get me another one. Right. Um. So we have this. The, the, this trailer out and it's received, it's been well received, especially from the industry. If you could have it your way, mm. what would you want to see come from the trailer? If you could write it any way you wanted to, how right. would you like to see it, your story unfolded? Well, um, from a purely bit, I mean, from like to preserve my legacy, you know, I'd like to get the documentary right. And just to like help tell other people's stories too, because within my story, it's a lot about the other people's stories. I right. feel like that's what, like I'm cool, I'm interesting or whatever, but what's more interesting than me is all these other people, the far side or Warren G, or, you know what I mean? So right. we can kind of get within my story, how my interaction with some of these people too. And you know, I've had a crazy life. I worked on all these movies. I, I've done a lot of different things. You know, Chris Spencer, the comedian was like, you hired me to do my first script, you know? And that picture I sent you was from a big like, comedy like a snap off thing that was going on you know so i've been involved in a lot of different aspects of, of urban culture so i'm excited to kind of like document that as a documentary film uh but there's already been an offer from a huge production company to do it as a scripted you know like loosely based on netflix style series so that's kind of dreamy for me you know to hopefully be executive producer sitting back in that big chair yeah. on the set where there's some corny white guy trying to act cool you know playing me or whatever <laughs> you know what i'm saying and me getting big checks from it i mean you know that's the dream you know so uh i think my story is interesting enough and i think that um you know they can fabricate it you know loosely based on everything too i think the time my story is is interesting enough that could make a really cool um scripted series so, I mean, man, if that really happens, and I got a great company interested already, so um, that would be pretty dreamy. Right. Also, because it would probably be very financially rewarding for me. Absolutely. A nice and appropriate it would still for me. be dreamy. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, um, and it would also give me an opportunity to do what I really want to do, which is tell more stories, tell other people's stories, and put more people on. I mean, imagine I could get a Kareem acting role in it. You know what I'm saying? Hey. I could get like, you know, my homies to do score. I mean, like, you know, just all Kareem, kinds of stuff. My Kareem man Chris said, over here could, could contribute music, you know, like I was saying too, you know, so that's what really excites me about it, you know. Kareem, Kareem said he does a mean Quincy Jones impersonation. Hey, man. <laughs> 
we might want, we might even get him a bigger part. You know, somebody who was even more about that. You know, Kareem sure. is also a really good whisper. He's a really good <laughs> member of the whispers. He does that really well as well. <laughs> You don't love me. Okay, <laughs> oh I have two questions, and then I'm gonna let you go. I swear, two okay. questions. They're really short. Really short. One, are you related to um, the music industry legend Gary Stewart that passed recently? No. Okay. And two, being that you grew up in Crenshaw, are you inherently attracted to black women, or is it just like eh, I'm out there with anybody? I definitely date all races. Yeah. I, I, I kind of, I think... Um, but, Pete, where, but Pete, where do you lean towards, though? Where you lean, right, where you lean. And I ain't trying to put you on blast, but I, I, done, been to, I done been to some Paul Stewart events. Oh, I'm known for having a lot of very beautiful black women at my yeah. place. <laughs> all ethnicities, though. Exotic women, all ethnicities, not just black women, you know, mixed women. No, for women, real. You know, no, for right, real. What's funny, white. Pete, is you didn't really have a lot of white girls at your parties. Right. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> he said, right. Sorry. <laughs> Let me back up. Okay. <laughs> no, um, chocolate. Well, for me personally, I found that like white girls either think I'm too hood or if they're like that, then they'd rather date a brother. Right. So, <laughs> I, I haven't found that many white girls that I gel with. I met a lot of black girls that were like, I, I grew up around white people and I like you. I feel comfortable with you. And you're kind of like, I'm trying to get into my hood side. So, you know, my cousins are hood, you know, so or whatever, you know, too. Or, but I, I've dated all races. I don't, I think, you know, to have a particular race is a little bizarre. I, I, for me, I've just always been open to, you know, uh, uh, all ethnicities. Uh, black women are amazing. I mean, look at them nails, Marlo. Jay got over there, I mean, that smile, you know. I mean, it's hard to not love black women. Macaroni, you know what I'm saying? Macaroni Tony. <laughs> right, but, but uh, I, I can't Listen, discriminate. I take it all, what? Yeah, I can't discriminate okay, against other races or anything. I mean, that, that would be crazy for me. Right. I, I, you know, I'm, it's more about the heart inside, you know what I mean? So, yeah. Oh, that well, if that wasn't politically correct, if that wasn't like he's running Listen, for office. You see how you do that on there? I say, yeah, I see how you did that. Uh -huh. Sprinkle me, man. Sprinkle running for me. office, Paul Stewart. <laughs> I had to uh, sprinkle a little game there at the end, you know, right? <laughs> uh, Smooth D, anything else? Any more questions on your end? Uh, let me go to the, nope. I think I asked everything in the IG. Everybody was kind of feeling, feeling the story. Everybody. Yeah. And they want to, yeah, uh, yeah. they definitely you know, looking forward to seeing more. But it's, yeah. It's awesome. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Any, I appreciate people spreading the trailer cause that helps me, you know, uh, views always, you know, likes it's amazing. Yeah. So far we only have one dislike. I shouldn't even say that cause somebody probably start going to dislike. Right. And but where so can they see we, it? Where can they see the trailer? Uh, YouTube, View Park Records. That's my uh, that's my company. That's my uh, Evan Washington, my partner. Let me shout him out. Let me shout out uh, uh, Marcus Thornton, my man who made the trailer, Sizzle, Mini Doc, as he calls it. And uh, yeah, View Park Records, YouTube. Google a white boy from Crenshaw. It's the only thing that's going to come up. Uh, I guess I'm one of the only. But I yeah. there, I've heard of a few that's a little more hood than me. Uh, white boy Dave's or whatever, you know, this and that. So shout outs to them, you know. But um, I took that experience, got into the music industry, and it, it worked out great for me. So I'm, I'm grateful to the neighborhood. I'm trying to give back to the community uh, and give back to people, young artists, all the time. That's my thing. And, you know, it comes back to me. You know, you, you give to the right young artist, and, oh, man, you know, they're popping in, and they say, hey, you know, let me help me with this or whatever. You know, I'm open for business. So, right. You know. I heard that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Pete, when you sent me the trailer and I looked at it, I hit him right back, like, yo, this is really inspirational. Like, this is really, it was, I felt it was just done really dope. Like, it made me want to tell my story. And I hit Paul, like, I'm going to have to get my documentary off, Paul, because this ah. is, did a really good job. Nobody want to hear that, Doc. Marla, you're such a hater, though, but it's okay. <laughs> but I thought I thought it was done, done really well, Paul. I and, and I can't wait to see how... Um, how it all unfolds, man. Cause I think I can't either. And you gotta make sure that when you when you finish it, you send it to me so that I can put it on my watch list. Definitely. I'm a I'm a I'm a uh I'm gonna be blasting it out. I'm gonna try to maybe come with some more content while we're working on it. Cause you know it's gonna take a little while, you know. Right. See people right. uh hyped on it. People are uh, um there's some very cool people talking to me about a podcast, you know, so um, you know, look, I I'm just trying to uh, like I said, take advantage of this and 
and do as much cool shit as I can. There's a lot of other stories of people like that need to be told. Uh, you know, hip hop kind of doesn't get its just due as a culture. You know what I mean? So there's like a lot of uh, important kind of urban culture in general just doesn't get its just dues, you know? Sometimes the way the stories are told and, you know, so I don't want to just do documentaries, but I'd love to do a bunch more after we knock this one out of other people, you know what I mean, so. One last question, I promise. Okay, seriously, one last question and then, then we out of here, for real. Okay. Um, being who you are, how, how did the whole George Floyd and the protests and the broke Black Lives Matter and all those, how did that affect you and how, and what was, how did you, involved in, in mm. all, during all with all this that's a good Being question that you are a white man and right. that but you know the neighborhood and you sure. know the culture no, that's a good question well it broke my heart you know i mean that shit always breaks my heart you know it just saddens me and 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 it the reaction just just saddens me that like there's any discussion or debate about this shit and like you know when when is the justice system gonna like going to start punishing these people because I think it's it's implausible to imagine a world where there's no kind of like conflict between what would be a police and pe you know what I mean but like it's just so out of hand that that people right. never get punished for this you know and this this blue code is so much bullshit you know what I mean and so it hurt me and you know I was I was out of the country in March I had gone to the Dominican Republic for a week and I ended up staying because of COVID and so when all that was going on, I was over there and just seeing the videos of L.A. burning up and everything. And I was just like kind of disconnected in some way because I was out of the country. But everyone's timeline, everyone, it was all anybody that I knew was talking about on, on, on social media or anything, you know. So, I mean, you know, it, just in general, the, the race relations moving in the wrong direction has just depressed the hell out of me because I never really envisioned this as a kid. So I, or even younger, I expect to be going in the other direction, you know. I never thought we'd have a black president. You see something like that and you think, oh my God, shit's getting better. You know, my, our country isn't so racist. They, and then to see what happened after that, you know what I mean? And just, mm -hmm. but I was, I was, in, I was, I'm good. I, I was, I was uh, impassioned by the protest and, and moved by it. You know what I mean? And, and um, I felt it was much needed. I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to get a, I'm trying to get an app going that's, uh, for voting based on candidates and uh, and um, and uh, initiatives based on police reform, so like to tell you who you should vote for if you want police reform, mm. because there's there's just I mean I'm not I'm I'm so political that I'm anti political in a way if that makes any sense like I study politics and world history and stuff so much that I'm so disgusted with our system that I almost don't want to participate right so many right. years haven't voted you know right. what I mean a few things drove me out you know but um so anyway yeah that, to answer your question you know it motivated me to want to do positive things uh it saddened me it kind of made me want to stay out the country too uh I'll say that Right. And uh, yeah, but you know, um, yeah, let's move on positive from it. Right. You know, let's all try to, you know, what can we do? You know, but it's very sad, very, you know, and uh, I, I was proud of people for protesting so much and all that, because when I when it went down, I wasn't here. So I didn't even have the choice, really, if I was going to participate in it or not, you know. Right. Um, well, there it is, man. My man, Paul Stewart. Yeah. Uh, once again, thanks for coming by the AM Caffeine Show. Look, Paul, as you as you embark on this journey and get White Boy from Crenshaw up and running, you already know you have an open door policy here, man. Well, I can't wait to see it because I think it's going to be incredible. And you already know anything that I could do to help. You know, you already know how how um, I, I feel about you and what you've done, especially for not just music in general, but for West Coast music. I think mm -hmm. what you've done has been so important. Uh, so I can't wait for that story to be untold. So, you know, we, we're here at the AM Caffeine Show. Absolutely. Uh, how, and tell us how everybody can follow you and how can they keep up with what you're doing? Yeah. On okay. Social media. Yes. Instagram will be the easiest way to find me. Paul underscore DJP underscore Stuart. Um, I'm starting to fuck around on Clubhouse a little bit. So you can maybe follow me over there. Um, I have a Facebook, but I don't really check it like that. 
So, but yeah, reach out to me on Instagram, follow me, send me a message. I'll try to, you know, uh, uh, get back and uh, listen to your music if that's what it is. Or if you got, you know, if you're a visual artist or something else, I'm, I'm interested. I work in the arts, you know what I mean? And, you know, in, in many capacities, you know, so uh, I'm always looking for new talent, new stuff. So, you know, I appreciate the opportunity and, and spreading the word about my project. Um, it, it was it was a true pleasure to be on. I appreciate it. You already know what it is, AM Captain Show, my man Paul Stewart, you guys. Make sure you follow him and support everything that he has going on. Thanks, Pete. Anytime, man. All right, you guys. Have a great evening. You too. Bye, Bye Carlo. <laughs> Bye. 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 Macaroni. Tony. Macaroni, Tony. Tony. All right, Chris. Yeah, All right, later. Later. Bye. AM Caffeine Show. So, again, you can catch the AM Caffeine Show each and every Wednesday and Friday. Uh, oh. Follow us on Instagram and all over the place. Matter of fact, Marlo J, how can folks find you? Because you have so many things going on. You're no, hard. I don't. You're you hard to keep it track. Me. You can follow everything I'm doing at MarloJ.com or you can follow my Instagram and everything social media at Marlo J, M A R L O J A Y E. But make sure you subscribe, share, and comment on Black Girl Said and That Girl Said, both on YouTube and anywhere. You listen to podcasts. Smoothie, what about you? <laughs> <laughs> I can't stand that. <clears throat> Wait a minute, Marlo. Let, uh, let folks know if you get a chance to do it today. Let folks know about Marlo oh. J's watch list and how they can see that. Oh, you can see Marlo J's watch list on our social media. You can It's, it's on any of our social media at Marlo J. And uh, make sure that you check out what I'm saying you watch because you will watch it and then you'll love it. And if you don't, let me know. Comment, share, subscribe on that as well on my social media as well as AM Caffeine. Smooth D. <laughs> All right, before, <laughs> right, before I drop that info, man, once again, shout out to everybody checking in on IG, yeah. Twitch, and Facebook, Kareem Grimes, Justice, Jamie, Tara, ooh, uh, and a few other people hopped in and hopped out. But appreciate y'all. Y'all can catch me on everything at Smooth D, and that's S M Triple O T H D Double E. And previewing for this Saturday, 12 12, the AM Caffeine Show. And the Get Down Digi Mix Show is coming with Smooth D's virtual holiday party. It's going down on Zoom. So if you want to join in with us, uh, go to smoothd.com. And that's S M Triple O T H D Double E dot com in your mouth. In your mouth, AM Caffeine Show. And please join us on Saturday because we will be having Smooth D's first annual 2020 holiday twerk off. Marlo J will be starring in this. Okay, twerk first off. of all, I didn't agree to that. Oh, you did? Oh. <laughs> oh, oh you did. We didn't tell you about that? <laughs> Let me see. Oh, don't worry about that. We'll, we'll tell you. But if you guys want to, see Marlo's, if you want to see Marlo's backside in all its glory, it's going okay, down. First of all, don't be selling me. Don't be selling me. <laughs> Marlo, I tell we got to put you out here on, the, on, the, on this stroll, man. No, we don't. No, we don't. We don't. And that's exactly what we don't have to do. <laughs> let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. AM Caffeine Show. You guys enjoy the rest of your day. Make sure you follow us at AM Caffeine Show. You can follow me, D-O- yeah. at DLC 221 ENT. And we will be back on Friday. It's the AM Caffeine Show. We up out of here in your mouth. Oh, what's up? Uh,